My name is Claire. I'm one of the HE advisors here at the University of Chester, and I'm here along with uh, my colleague Abby, who's helping behind the scenes today. So just a few housekeeping points before I hand over to Nick. Um, just want to short start by reassuring you that your video and audio are not shared at all during the course of this session. Um, during the presentation, you will be able to ask questions in the chat function on the right hand side of the screen. You can ask questions anonymously if you wish. You just need to have ticked the box to say that you want to be anonymous. You can also like questions that other people might ask during the presentation so that we can ask those questions of Nick right at the end. Um, we'll save all the questions up to the end and ask and ask Nick the questions then. Um, so that is everything from me. So if Nick's ready, I'll hand over to you now, Nick. Sure, thank you. OK, off you go, Nick. OK, can you see my slides OK? Yeah, yeah that's perfect. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. So welcome everybody. My name is Nick Hulbert Williams and I'm a coaching psychologist and a professor of behavioural medicine in the School of Psychology here at Chester. Behavioural medicine is a subject that brings together psychologists with a range of other social scientists to better understand how we can keep people healthy and how we can support their psychological well-being when they do become ill. And my own particular research focus in this area is in exploring this in the context of cancer. And so a lot of my work has explored how we can keep people healthy emotionally and physically after their cancer treatment has ended. So when we're thinking about global causes of illness and disease, we often split those illnesses into two categories, communicable and non-communicable diseases. The non-communicable category includes things like cancer, heart disease, diabetes and those kind of chronic illnesses. And currently they account for around 70% of deaths worldwide. And this has been increasing each year. The World Health Organization estimates that up to around about 80% of the risk of developing those kind of non-communicable chronic diseases might be accounted for by people's lifestyle choices. Now, specific to my field of work in cancer, we know that the lifetime risk of developing cancer in people born after 1960 is around about 50%. That means that one in every two people born in the last 60 years are expected to get cancer at some point during their lifetime. Now, survival has increased phenomenally in recent years. We've got much better at diagnosing earlier and treating cancer more effectively. But nonetheless, it's estimated that up to 40% of those cancer cases could be prevented by lifestyle improvement. We also know that the choices that people make about their lifestyle and how um, what kind of behaviours they engage with can affect how they respond to treatments and how likely their cancer is to return in the future. So that influences each individual's particular um, overall survival chances. So most of you will have a, a sense, a, a kind of common sense understanding of what health behaviours are. But we're talking here about lifestyle risk factors things like our diet, whether we're overweight or obese, whether we smoke, how much alcohol we consume. But for certain illnesses, other specific behaviours are important too. For example, sun-related behaviours. For general wellbeing, we know that getting sunlight regularly provides vitamin D, which is a protective factor for our health. But if we spend too long in the sun without protection and we burn too badly on a frequent basis, that can then increase our risk of developing skin cancers in the future. And we often focus on the things that we shouldn't do, but there are some health behaviours which are protective. For example, not getting enough, uh, get, getting um, good quality sleep and staying active can be really beneficial for us. Now, that doesn't mean running marathons. It just means getting some regular gentle exercise. Sedentary behaviours, that is spending large amounts of time not moving around during the day, is estimated to be linked to around 50,000 deaths in the UK alone each year. And that's a cost to the NHS of about 0.7 billion pounds of their annual budget. And the importance of health behaviours have never been so stark as they have been over the past 12 months. The journal article that I've put on this slide here reports just one study that's been done by a UK based team that has shown that unhealthy lifestyles significantly increase the risk of somebody developing a severe reaction to the COVID-19 infection. Now, to put that into perspective, more than 27% of adults are classed as overweight, and that factor alone increases the risk of death from severe COVID-19 by almost 40%. And it isn't just that poor lifestyle behaviours affect the body, they 
change our behavior too. So smokers are both more likely to catch and to die from COVID-19. That risk of death is related to the sustained lung damage that they've gained from cigarette smoke over the years. That makes them vulnerable to a severe infection. But the risk of catching COVID in the first place is increased simply because smokers, um, they more often touch their face and their mouth. So they spread infection through touch more frequently. Now, I'm bound to say this as a psychologist, but the brain is a complex and wonderful thing. It gives us as humans a unique way of experiencing the world full of cognitive components. So our thoughts and emotions, how we feel and our moods. But in truth, we're still a very long way away from fully understanding the complexities of the mind. And I think psychology can sometimes get things a little bit wrong in making assumptions about how the mind can affect our behaviour. Most models of behaviour change in health psychology predict that the likelihood that somebody will change their behaviour in positive ways comes down to how we think about it. So how serious we think the illness is that we might be trying to avoid or how susceptible we are to that in the first place. Our appraisals of the benefits of changing behaviour, how confident we are about being able to change that behaviour successfully, thoughts like that. Now, essentially, these kinds of models assume that humans are rational agents that will make the right decisions if we're given the right kind of information and knowledge. But unfortunately, that just isn't true. We've got lots of evidence now that most people don't understand risk enough to make rational decisions. And we often underestimate how much our emotional state and our learning history can override our cognitions. Now, what this often unfortunately leads to are people who have lots of well-intentioned thoughts. They have really good intentions to change their behavior, but that never really develops into actual behavior change. And in health psychology, we sometimes refer to this as the intention implementation gap. So we probably need to start thinking about doing something a little bit differently. Now, there were lots of different subgroups within psychology. I'm most interested in behavioral psychology, specifically a type of psychology called contextual behavioral science. Now, as a subdiscipline within psychology, as behavioral psychologists tend to take quite a pragmatic view of the world. We think it's less important that we know exactly what processes are happening in the brain because it's more important that just we understand behaviour enough to be able to predict and influence or change people's behaviour. So for us, it's not quite so problematic that changing cognitions and changing intentions aren't that effective in leading to behaviour change. The other important influence in this area comes from behavioural economics. This is the study of factors which affect the decisions that um, individuals and groups make. And behavioural economics are really interested in the boundaries of rationality in those decision making processes and the mechanisms that influence the choices that the public make. One of the really big influences in this field of study is Professor Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize in 2002. And over his career, he's produced results of many studies which have confirmed that decision making processes are actually habitual. They're often unconscious and they can be very easily influenced by a simple set of heuristics or rules of thumb. Essentially, he's demonstrated that human decision making is actually not as rational as we might hope it would otherwise be. To give you a sense of the kind of heuristics that affect behavioural decision making, here are some examples of some important ones. So first, availability. If we have to make a choice between two things, but one aspect of that decision making process comes more easily than the other, then our decision making is going to be biased towards making that easy choice. Second, smaller immediate rewards are preferred over later larger rewards, and we call this future discounting. Now, if you want an example of this, just think about smoking. We've had decades of health promotion campaigns warning about the longer term health risks of smoking, but they were never quite as effective as we thought they might be because those consequences come so much later down the line. The short term benefits of smoking, for example, on people's mood or just easing that distress of having a, a craving finally met outweighs those longer term risks considerably. And finally, status quo, sometimes we refer to this as inertia. Human beings are effort minimizers. We'll tend to always go with the decision that requires the most minimal change 
or minimal decision load, whether or not that's the best decision for us to make in the longer term. And that leads us to nudge theory. So the term nudge theory was popularized by this 2008 book by Thala and Sunstein. And the theory suggests that we need to change what they call choice architecture. That is the way that different options are presented. And this is in contrast to some of those less successful strategies. For example, we know that telling people about the health risks of smoking, which we sometimes call fear messaging, isn't effective because that increased fear sometimes makes them fall back on their unhealthy habits more readily as a way of coping with that fear. And we know that if we simply remove choice, people may rebel against that because they feel that their free will is being taken away. So instead, we need to consider ways to change how those choices are presented to make it more likely that the healthier option seems more desirable to the person making that choice. And there are three different categories, roughly, of, of uh, nudges that we can use. So cognitive nudges are those which change our knowledge. Affective nudges are those which change our emotional state of, or feelings. And behavioural nudges are those which aim to change behaviour without changing what we know or feel. And I'm going to talk you through an example of each of those to describe what each of those is. So we know that just providing new knowledge doesn't always work, but integrating knowledge change into a nudge can be effective. For example, we all know that some foods are better for us than others. But in the moment of choice, whether that's in the supermarket or looking at a menu in a restaurant, we don't always make the best choice for our long term health. But by using colour coded information on the front of packaging or in menus, we can make the comparative visibility of different choices much more stark. We can make that healthier option appear much more obvious and apparent, and that might nudge different behavioural choices. And in terms of changing how we feel, telling somebody that one food choice over another is more healthier is unlikely to make us feel considerably good about ourselves. However, telling me that one choice is much tastier or fresher is much more likely to make me feel positive or excited about that choice. And that might well nudge my decision making in a certain direction. And behavioural nudges can be really quite simple things. For example, just changing where we place food on supermarket shelves impacts uh, purchasing patterns. Changing the size of plates that we provide at an all-you-can-eat buffet will encourage people to simply take less food. Now, thinking specifically about health behaviours, I'm going to give you two examples that I think are particularly interesting. I've already said that humans are not rational. In fact, we can be really quite irrational sometimes and really vulnerable to acting on impulse. And that's why for so long, certain items have been put next to cash registers at the supermarket or in cafeterias. So that when you're in the queue waiting to pay, your attention will be drawn to them and you'll be tempted to buy something extra. But so often it's been food choices that are not good for our diet. It's usually sweets, chocolate bars, confectionery that are put at the counters. So one example of a behavioural nudge might be to put something else there instead. For example, adding fruit to that selection and making that more attention grabbing by placing it at eye level and hiding the chocolate somewhere that's a little harder to see has been demonstrated to be effective at changing behaviour. When sweets are replaced at the cash register in cafeterias, for example, overall fruit sales increase. And you know, if you're struggling with some of the same things at home, you can do some simple things to nudge your own behaviour in this same healthy direction. For example, you could choose to eat your dinner off a smaller plate. You could put the biscuit barrel on the top shelf of your cupboard so that it's harder to reach, or put a bowl of fresh fruit out on the kitchen worktop so that it's just more convenient and that that's what you see first when you go into the kitchen. If you want to cut down on your alcohol intake, for example, you could just rearrange your drinks cupboard to put the bottles of spirits behind the soft drinks, for example. I love these examples of getting people to use the stairs instead of lifts or elevators as a way to nudge more active lifestyles. As you can see here, the one on the left is more of a cognitive nudge because it's providing some information to try and change the behavior to using the stairs. The one on the right is more behavioral. 
Now, in this case, the stairs were actually turned into a live piano. They actually made a sound, so it became a fun alternative to using the elevator. Now, there's probably an element of emotional nudge in this one too. I mean, how could you not smile and feel better about your day if walking up or down the stairs was making some music as you did it? Now, most of you probably aren't aware that your health behavior is being constantly nudged throughout the day. For example, through the pandemic, there is a real reason that hand sanitizers have been placed at the entrance to shops. It nudges people to use them. And what about Apple Watch owners? You are constantly getting those nudges to stand up every hour. We get those emotional nudges at the end of the day after completing your activity rings. That then encourages to change our behavior and maintain those patterns on an ongoing basis. And this stuff does work, but there's been some really interesting work that's been done to compare different types of nudges and how effective they are. Now, as a behavioral psychologist, I'm especially pleased here to see that the doing all those behavioral nudges are consistently the type that come out as most effective in changing behavior. And as an applied psychologist, I love to see examples of good psychology being put into practice. Nudge theory has become so effective that our own government and others around the world have set up specific research and policy units. Here in the UK, that's called the Behavioural Insights Team. And they do this kind of work on a national scale. So the Nudge Unit, as it's often referred to, has now run over 750 projects. And these go well beyond just changing health behaviours. Their projects have ranged from using nudge theory to encourage who participates in the elections, through to how many people sign up for the organ donation register, through to tackling tax evasion and benefit sanctions, right through to encouraging more regular charitable gift giving. The scope for this is massive. Behaviour change is never easy, and I think changing our behaviours to become healthier and to um, choose now to live a lifestyle that's going to benefit us in 40, 50 years time is especially difficult. But the evidence for nudge theory is building to show just how effective and easy it can be. And as we've explored today, it's something that we can easily apply to our own lives if we just need to change our behaviour in our day to day living when we're at home, for example. So I hope you've enjoyed that little overview and introduction to health psychology and nudge theory. And of course, I'm happy to try and answer some of your questions if you have any. I've put my Twitter handle at the bottom of this slide just in case you'd like to follow me to learn a bit more about my work. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Nick. That was that was fascinating in, in lots of ways. Um, I'm just waiting for the questions to come in. So we don't have any at the moment from our audience, um, but there are a couple of questions that sort of occurred to me while I was listening to you. Um, so you, you talked about, you know, how, how the nudge theory um, has become um, more prevalent and, you know, we've seen that lots of examples of that. Why do you think that's more effective than just simply trying to change the way people act? Why do you think nudge theory works? I think the best way to answer that is by comparing it to some of those traditional strategies that try and change how we think. I think thinking is what we do. As human beings, our lives are just spent inside our heads, thinking and communicating our thoughts. And I think we therefore assume that it's easy to change and control what we're thinking. But actually we've seen over and over that as much as we think we can control our thoughts, that doesn't always lead to an effective behavior change. But actually, what we do by just nudging behaviour in certain directions is almost unconsciously we get people to start behaving in a different way, even though they're not changing the cognitions that might be influencing that decision. And what that does is it creates new learning. It creates new habits and new learning that's being re reinforced in different ways. So to Give you an example for that for somebody who's thinking they need to do more exercise and to get more physically active while we're making that decision we can have lots of cognitions going on about how that's going to be good for us in the long term but it's going to be really difficult it's going to be hard work i might need to rearrange my day to do that i might have muscle aches for a couple of days afterwards there's all these kind of different and competing cognitions going on but actually if we can just get somebody 
being a bit more physically active, what they realize is that that isn't as bad as they thought it might be. Well, and as soon as you start to do those exercises, you realize there are benefits that you might not have thought about. So doing a bit of exercise boosts your emotions. It gives you a, a bit of an uplift. And that uplift then reinforces the fact that you've done some of that behavior. So you're then more likely to choose to do that again in the future because you've had that beneficial result. Does that make sense? That makes absolute sense. I see myself in that example, Nick. Whenever, <laughs> whenever I, whenever I think I should go for a run, I try and remember how good I felt after the last run, even though the thought of going out of the house really doesn't appeal to me. So yeah, I can completely understand that. Um, and you talked a lot about um, sort of the health benefits. You know, using this in in the context of health. So from um, trying to get people to to have a healthier lifestyle to avoid diseases like diabetes and 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 cancer. Do you think nudge theory could work? Um, in terms of getting us to change our behaviour with regard to coronavirus? Is that something that, that we could do? You talked about the hand sanitizer, but do you think there's anything else that we could be doing or you know, the government could be doing to help us with that? I think coronavirus is a really hard one. I think we are already doing a lot of things that we should be doing. <laughs> um, I think the hand sanitizers and just availability of hand sanitizers hand sanitizers is just a massive um, nudge in the right direction. Yeah. I don't think we'd have anywhere the num near the number of people using that if they weren't just being made available on that kind of national scale. Um, obviously, there are other behaviours related to coronavirus that we need to think about, things like mask wearing and things that some people are a little bit resistant to doing. And I, I think a lot of the messaging I talked in my in my presentation about fear messaging in the context of smoking and the long term health risks of that. And I think a lot of what we have been hearing in the kind of coronavirus messaging is about fear messaging. It's about if you don't behave like this, these are going to be the negative consequences. And I do wonder whether actually we should be reframing some of those a little bit differently. Um, I think Currently, this is often presented as wear a mask or don't wear a mask. And the don't wearing a mask is a really bad thing to do. Maybe something that's just really simple for us to think about is giving people the choice of different masks, giving, having a bit of an element of choice there. So you're choosing between lots, there's lots of kind of positive outcomes of your choice, but only one negative option. That might shift things. And giving people a bit more control over what they're doing rather than just enforcing decisions i think is probably important as well yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense and um, we've actually had a couple of questions come through from from the people watching at home nick so the first question is how effective do you think technology is or can be at facilitating nudges to change behavior things like the apple watch and the smartphone and how does this compare with non-tech nudges oh i don't know that there's much research that has compared them. Um, I think I think one thing I would say though is that we often become a little bit used to technology. I think technology is now such an important part of our lives and it's kind of with us wherever we go, particularly now we've got smartphones and these Apple watches and things. I'm as guilty of this as anybody. They kind of just become who we are. Um, so I talked in my talk about those kind of um, Apple messages to, to stand up every hour. Um, I just got to the point some days where I just ignore those. I'm just used to that popping up and I think, oh, I've not got time for that at the minute. Um, now, often that's because there's so much else going on in my life. There's so much else to um, that, that my brain is focused on. Whereas on days where I'm able to pay that a bit more attention and when there's less going on, I'm more likely to follow that nudge. Now, the activity rings, I think, have more of an effect because actually if I get to the end of the day and I've not completed those activity rings, that makes me feel disappointed. I talk about an emotional and an effective nudge. I really, as a person, I really do feel that and that makes me think tomorrow I need to do more. I need to do better at this. So that I is think, so true. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think different nudges probably work to different extents through technology. But I think there's some really interesting research to be done on that, looking at that a bit more. I know lots of teams are, are doing those, those kind of projects at the minute. 
Yeah, that is, it is fascinating, isn't it? Because like, I'm exactly the same. You know, during the day, it's hard to make yourself stand up and move away from your screen when you're when you're focused on something. But then when you get to the end of the day, you do feel really disappointed that just one minute of standing would have completed that ring. So, yeah, I'm completely with you there, Nick. Um, somebody else has asked if you have a lot of behaviours that you want to change at once, for example, more exercise, changing your diet, looking at your finances. Does nudge theory help you tackle those in tandem or are you likely to be more successful if you tackle them one at a time? Um, I would always start small. <laughs> I think um, feeling successful at changing a little bit of one behaviour is going to motivate you to try and then change more because it builds your sense of confidence. It builds what we call self-efficacy. If you had success in one area, you're then more likely to, to feel like you can take on more change. Mm -hmm. um, actually, nudge theory, I think, probably works better if you don't know that you're being nudged in the first place. Um, because these are kind of unconsciously nudging us, um, I think there's only there are limits to how much we can nudge ourselves. So if we're trying to change behavior for ourselves, nudge theory is probably only going to work to a certain extent. Um, and as I say, in a kind of cumulative way. Um, but I think if there's lots of change needing to be done, start small, start with something manageable, um, a goal that you can achieve that's going to give you that emotional uplift to make you think you can then take more on. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. That's good advice. Um, so just one more question, Nick. Um, so you've talked a lot about nudge theory in terms of, of health, you know, in terms of diet and physical activity. Is it used a lot in other areas? So things I'm thinking um, somebody, one of our audience members mentioned there, you know, looking at your finances, but maybe things like environmental, environmentally, that sort of thing. Is, is it used in other areas successfully? Yeah, it's being used across the board of, of changing and influencing people's behaviour. So I talked about the Behavioural Insights um, Unit uh, yeah. in the UK government. So they're looking at it in a broad range of areas. I think some of the environmental stuff is really particularly interesting. So, for example, if you um, if you Google this, you'll find lots of examples of just images of nudges. Um, I found one earlier that I didn't include in my slides, but it was, um, you know, those rubbish bins where you separate out your different types of recycling. Yeah. Um, there are some of those which instead of labeling the kind of other general waste as general waste, they label it as landfill. So right. just that subtle change in how we're labeling it is then going to influence whether you want to just automatically take the easy option of just dumping everything into the landfill or whether you're then going to separate it into the recycling. So there's lots of different ways that we can use this in sometimes subtle but sometimes really quite obvious ways. Um, and I think environment and environmental choices are something that we really can change with this. Yeah, no, that's that, that makes perfect sense. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's, there's an emotional reaction to that as well, isn't it? If you see your rubbish going somewhere, that says landfill, quite categorically landfill, then you are much less likely to, to throw it in there. So no, that's fascinating. Um, well, that's been really interesting, Nick. So we don't have any other questions. So I think we'll um, we'll round things up for today's session, if that's OK. So just sure. leaves me to say thank you very much for your time today, Nick. I hope everyone's found that interesting. Um, we do have a lot more kitchen sessions running throughout January and into February. So have a look at the schedule um, and do sign up to any more that you're interested in. Um, we'll just pop the link in the comments there. And so if you do have a look at the schedule, or see if there's anything else you're interested, in, you're very welcome to join us for future kitchen sessions. So thanks a lot for joining us. Um, I hope everyone has a lovely evening and we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Thank you. Bye.